Hello, my name is Alf Hornborg and I'm an anthropologist uh, and professor of human ecology at Lund University in Sweden. I would like to talk with you now about money. Um, and in about 30 minutes, I would like to summarize some of my major perspectives on money and how m our money system could be changed. Uh, and I will show you a PowerPoint that I have made and um, I hope uh, everything is going to work technically. This is a bit new to me. Um, I'd like you to begin by looking at these images. Um, the top map shows um, the global distribution of money, basically. Uh, it's a map of GDP density showing um, how much money is made per square kilometer. And as you can see, the, the uh, darkest areas, the crimson areas, are the areas where most money is made. Uh, and the bottom map is not really a map, it's a composite satellite image made by um, connecting a number of satellite images of nighttime lights, uh, showing basically what the planet looks like from, from a satellite. And uh, these lights I think of as being indicative of industrial infrastructure or if you will, technology. So basically these two maps show the distribution of money in the world and the distribution of technology in the world. And I think the first thing you will notice is that the two maps are almost identical. So where there is money, there's technology and vice versa. And um, to me, this illustrates a very important point that money and technology are really two sides of the same coin. Um, to accumulate technological infrastructure, you need money. And of course, access to technological infrastructure will give you more money. Okay, uh, so this is the global world system of capital accumulation viewed from outer space. Um, and uh, I think we need to really get a detached view of what money is. Um, I think that the artifact of money is something that we rarely reflect on. Um, I'm from anthropology, as I said, and uh, in, in the field known as economic anthropology, we do a lot of thinking about how other societies not least in history, have organized exchange. And that helps us to defamiliarize um, the conventional money, mainstream money that we're used to, to, to get our eyes on the specificity and the peculiarity of our own kind of money, uh, which is, sometimes called general purpose or all purpose money. I'll get into that in a little while. But what we do see, I think, uh, is that politics uh, is very much about the tension between the logic that is inherent in money, in the money artifact, so to speak. And some would say capitalism as being synonymous with what I call the logic of money, okay? Um, but there's a tension between that logic and our political visions of a good society, a society that's sustainable, that's fair, that's secure, and so on. The problem, I think, is that the top priority of any capitalist enterprise, any, any corporate enterprise, must be maximum monetary profit. I just can't see how any company could ever prioritize anything else 
above monetary profit. Um, on the other hand, politicians must make nations attractive to capital. Uh, they are interested in having as many people employed as possible and in getting tax revenue both from employed people and from the corporations. So there is this uh, lock-in here where, where, where companies need to make money and politicians need to make their nations attractive to companies. So we're, we're stuck in this uh, focus on making money or, if you will, economic growth. I would say that the spectrum of different political positions that we see uh, is generated by the debate on how the logic of money and our visions of a good society can be made compatible. At one extreme, we have a neoliberal market fundamentalism uh, claiming that ungoverned economic growth is essential for visions of a good society. At the other extreme, we have leftists and a number of social movements who believe that a good society can only be achieved through political control of the economy. So these are the two polarized positions. Um, and I, I, I would argue that we need to go beyond this, this polarization in politics to ask ourselves how money itself could be redesigned. That is how politics might design a new monetary logic that would generate a good society uh, automatically, so to speak. So this is what I will argue for. Money is very much the elephant in the room. We just don't think about it. Uh, I've been looking for decades at debates on sustainability and global inequalities and people have all kinds of good ideas about how to change things except changing money. Now, if money is the root of all evil, if money is the cause of the problems, it seems we're looking in the wrong directions when we're thinking we're going to uh, mitigate the problems that money creates without changing the actual design of money. Now, I mentioned that the conventional money we use is, can be called all-purpose money. Uh, it's basically the idea that anything can be exchanged for anything else on the market. And uh, this is a human invention. We, we need to know that. And it's only a few hundred years old. I think if you go back, say, 400 years, um, very few people would imagine that they could spend money on buying what they eat for breakfast, for example. This is something that modern people have gotten used to, but it's not uh, necessary. Uh, and it's not a part of human history for a very long time. All-purpose money, that is the idea that everything can be exchanged for anything else, uh, it prompts humans to behave in ways that decrease sustainability and increase inequalities. It's an artifact that generates algorithms uh, promoting accelerating resource use, global ecological degradation, and rising income gaps. All these tendencies are sort of inherent in the logic of money, and uh, we can't really mitigate these problems without redesigning money itself to create an economy that restrains itself from such destructive tendencies, we must redesign money. Uh, or in other words, to curb the human destruction of the biosphere, we must gain control over the inherent logic of money. I wanna show you this diagram, which I published together with my colleague, Christian Dorninger, who designed these diagrams um, to show that if we look at world trade, not in terms of what the commodities are worth in money, 
but in terms of how much resources have been used in producing those commodities, then we see a very different pattern than what the economists see. Now, the economists, of course, are exclusively concerned with, with money, with market mechanisms uh, creating prices. But if we look at what sort of underneath the price tags, now you see these four diagrams. Uh, we can look at the amount of raw materials that have been embodied or invested in production, the amount of energy that's been embodied, the amount of land, and the amount of labor. Now, these were the four parameters that we looked at, but of course, it's possible to look at other biophysical parameters, like water, for example. Um, but the important thing is, if we look at these biophysical metrics rather than monetary value, we need to have other metrics than money. And as you can see, uh, in the to the left in each diagram, we have specified the metrics that we've used. Here, uh, when it comes to raw materials, we have ton per capita per year. In the next diagram, energy, we measure gigajoule per capita per year. Embodied land can be measured as hectares per capita per year. And embodied labor can be measured as person year equivalents per capita per year. Now, these are the biophysical resources that have been sort of invested in the commodities that are traded on the world market. And uh, you can see that the gray columns here represent imports, the black columns represent exports, and the white columns represents the balance, the difference between them, that is the net imports. And if you look systematically at these images, you will see that in all these four uh, cases, in, in, when it comes to all these four metrics and all the three areas that we looked at, it's the European Union, Japan, and the US. In the year 2007, we chose that year because it was, it was a year when we had data on all these um, resources. But in all these 12 cases, that is three areas, um, four different kinds of resources, you have a substantial net import to these wealthy areas. And these three areas, by the way, are very much the same areas that you saw in the satellite images and so on. These are the cores of the world system where most of the money is being made, where, well, to use another terminology, where capital is accumulated. So, um, as you can see, uh, world trade is highly unequal in the sense that there are asymmetric transfers of resources from peripheries to cores. And it's very obvious that these physical material resource transfers are not visible for the economists because they're only looking at the exchange value, the prices of the commodities, not at the, their, his, their material histories through which they have been produced, the amount of material energy, land, and labor, and so on, that's been used in producing them. So you could argue that, that money is a communicative disorder, um, and money does have a very peculiar uh, property if you think of money as a sign. Uh, semiotics is the study of signs, and, and uh, Charles Sanders' purse was the father of semiotics. He, he uh, distinguished between three categories of signs in human communication, the index, the icon, and the symbol. And I won't have time to get into that now, but I can assure you that conventional money doesn't fit into any of these categories. It can assume any meaning that its owner gives it. In other words, it's a sign without meaning. 
there are many strange things about money. Um, we could show, for example, that unlike the DNA molecule or the alphabet or, or, or other kinds of codes, the money code only has one character. Uh, and I would argue this is why it cannot convey meaningful messages, which always requires at least two characters to get some kind of binary uh, information. And also, of course, money transactions are always inherently asymmetrical because they're dependent on how much money people have, on people's assets. A dollar, for example, means very different things to uh, a rich person and a poor person. Finally, money can grow without any material constraints. Um, unlike, for example, food or land, there's no physical limit to the amount of money a person can control. So, so money is a very peculiar phenomenon and um, the only species that could ever have invented is, of course, is, is, is the human species. But we seem to take it for granted uh, where it's, whereas it's, it's, it's really a very strange phenomenon. Um, and to understand the asymmetries in, in the world system, we're not much helped by uh, labor or energy theories of values because um, it's, it's, it's really not logical to argue that resources are underpaid unless we can actually show that they have some kind of real value that is not covered by prices. And um, also use values, since they're actually culturally defined, um, we cannot talk about use values in terms of asymmetric flows of material resources because what really determines their use value is the symbolic systems that we have in a particular society. So in other words, as long as we think of trade in terms of underpaid values, we cannot establish that there is an equal or asymmetric exchange. So we need to rethink the concept of value, actually. Um, the economist, Nicolas Georgesco Reagan argued that an increase in, in exchange value or what the economists call utility implies an increase in physical entropy. So in other words, as money profits increase, energy and matter dissipate. Um, we should remember that neither labor nor energy has intrinsic value, but they're they're simply biophysical resources that are appropriated by capitalists in their creation of profits. Exchange value cannot be analytically derived from labor or energy. To argue that it would be possible is to confuse economics and physics. And just to, uh, to show you how I think about this issue, um, you can compare neoclassical economics, which is the mainstream school of economics today, with Marxist economics and ecological economics and how they relate resources to value and to price. For neoclassical economics, uh, value is simply the same as price. The embodied biophysical resources are irrelevant. For Marxists, uh, embodied labor is what defines value, but value is not uh, congruent with price because the embodied labor value is underpaid. And the ecological economic argument is very similar. I mentioned Howard T. Odom here, uh, where instead of embodied labor, we talk about embodied energy. And this, according to Odom, was the basis of value. But again, it was underpaid on the market. Now, I myself would argue that we need to think in terms of ecologically unequal exchange. There are resources asymmetrically transferred in the world, but we need not 
talk about value at all. We can show that the way resources tend to be priced in relation to the manufactured goods, there is an asymmetric transfer. And that's basically all we need to know about the system. I think introducing the word value really confuses things. Now, um, how do we move into a vision of a sustainable future? How do we escape from the conceptual prison house of money, which makes us think uh, that all the commodities in the world can be evaluated according to some universal standard? This is a way of thinking that derives from the way we have been immersed in in market economies for for 200 years but it's it's very illusory my suggestion is that national authorities can issue a complementary currency we could call it notes just to have a word for it uh, which can only be used to purchase locally produced goods and services and distribute this currency as a basic income to all residents of the country. Now this in a nutshell is what I argue uh, we could do. I'm arguing we could introduce a second kind of money. So we have two kinds of money alongside each other. Uh, and I will try to show why this would be a good solution to a lot of our problems. We would create an economy with two spheres of exchange. Now, this is a concept that, again, comes from economic anthropology. There are lots of societies we know of that have had more than one market or sphere of exchange. Um, so let's just imagine that we'd have, uh, alongside a global sector, very much like the modern economy, um, where the currency is conventional money, where wage labor is exchanged for, for money that is used to buy commodities on a global market the way we do today. If we, alongside this economy, um, created a local sector uh, where the currency used are these notes that I mentioned, and the notes are issued by the authorities and distributed as basic income, and exchanged only for locally produced goods and services. This, this is the idea. Now, this should raise a lot of questions. And in the article that I have um, sent to the organizers of this summer school called How to Turn an Ocean Liner, I've actually included 25 FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions. Uh, and these are three of the most common questions I get once I present this idea. One of them is, what does locally produced mean? Well, uh, these are goods and services originating within a given radius, say 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers or 70 kilometers. Um, the important thing is that there is a spatial geographical space specification of what is local from the place of purchase. In other words, um, I'm not talking about a number of local currencies, one for each municipality, basically. I'm talking about one single currency for the whole nation that can only be used for purchasing local goods and services. How then would this new currency be distributed? Well, for instance, by each month charging plastic cards with electronic points. Now, the objection you might have would be perhaps, isn't this just another local currency scheme? We all know that there have been lots of problems with the local currencies like LETS and so on. But unlike those schemes, where locally purchased goods can come from the other side of the globe, this proposal would promote a real localization of social metabolism. 
if you take for a, a local currency like the Bristol pound, for example, it's quite feasible to walk into any shop in the city of Bristol and buy electronic equipment produced in China. In other words, if that kind of local currency will not be a spanner in the wheel of globalization, uh, but this suggestion would because it defines the radius within which purchases can be made. What would be the point of um, a bicentric economy? That is an economy with two levels or two spheres of exchange. It would increase sustainability by reducing transports, emissions, resource use, waste. Um, it would reduce vulnerability by enhancing food security, diversity, community, resilience, and it would diminish inequalities. It would mitigate accumulation, polarization, and marginalization. So we would need to ask, of course, why uh, different categories of actors would want to deal with notes rather than regular money in order for this system to, to be attractive at all. Well, for households, it would reduce dependence on wage labor and, and the threat of unemployment. It would also increase social cooperation and community. For businesses, it would um, create competitive advantages for a corporation specialized on local products or local businesses. The notes they earn could also be used to buy local services as the demand for labor peaks. And finally, notes can be converted into regular money through the authorities applying adequate exchange rates that they can adapt to the situation, for example, to reduce the risk of inflation in notes in the local sector. The authorities finally uh, would find that this would reduce public costs for transport infrastructure, environmental protection, unemployment, social benefits, health care, and so on. So there's a long list of benefits. Uh, this flow diagram very simply shows that the authorities would issue the notes, they would distribute them to households, households would be able to use them um, among themselves or in relation to businesses, businesses would be able to use them uh, also in relation to households, in relation to themselves, and finally they would be able to uh, exchange a proportion of them into regular money from the authorities and that would sort of complete the cycle or the circle so that the notes would return back to the authorities. Now I won't be able to go through this list but I have a long list of advantages uh, with this system that are both ecological and social uh, and I will send this PowerPoint to the organizers so you can study this more if you want. Uh, but I'd like to end with a few words about the very special situation we have at the moment, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is one reason why this lecture is given online. Uh, and I think we need to ask the question if this pandemic has brought us closer to our vision of a good society, a sustainable world. And I would argue that in many ways, it actually has. Uh, at least it's made us imagine uh, a good society in much more tangible ways. The virus, as someone put it, has shut down the machine whose emergency brake we could not find. I think it's a wonderful metaphor. Uh, it has demonstrated how globalization increases vulnerability and risk. It has given us reasons to strengthen local economic diversity, food security and resilience. It has decreased our use of fossil energy and brought the American fossil fuel industry close to bankruptcy actually. It has reduced privileged and polluting consumption such as tourism, 
aviation and long distance transports. And it has instead taught us to replace travel with digital communication, such as this one, and to cultivate more place-based identities. Not least, and this is perhaps the most central point for us in the context of this summer school, the pandemic has increased our awareness of the powerful fiction of money. The authorities and national banks have said, well, we'll just print new money to keep business as usual going. There's no limit to the amount of money we're willing to inject into the economy to keep the system going. So money is very obviously not something we keep in a vault. Uh, it's something we just imagine out of thin air. And what it teaches us is that this fiction of money, this idea um, is actually transforming the world through climate change and ecological degradation and increasing global inequalities. So this fiction, this imaginary of money is actually entwined with the biophysical reality of the biosphere and it is destroying it. And we need to, we need to find ways of domesticating money, creating a new system uh, of money that leads to a good society, a sustainable world, and we can do it. Uh, we're in the middle of this huge game of monopoly. It's just that we believe that the rules cannot be changed. The rules can be changed because we humans have written them ourselves. And we can decide that this game is so dangerous for our own survival and those of other species that we need to change the rules. So it's in that spirit that I have um, presented this suggestion to you. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you.